All right, is it working today? It is working. Did you figure out what was wrong Wednesday? Uh, I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He did a lot of stuff. So there you go. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. And uh, we'll get started here. We've been studying giving uh, in the dispensation of grace. And we've been starting with this verse because it sort of lays the groundwork before you can really talk about giving and, 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 and how God wants us to give and what he wants us to give, you have to kind of get these principles about money. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking toward and studying together this morning. As we do so, we pray that the things said and done will honor and glorify the name of Christ. It would be edified to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, as I said, we started, we're starting with this verse because it, it talks to us about the love of money, our relationship to money. It talks about um, when, when that love of money becomes a problem, which is when it causes you to err from the faith. When coveting after money or the things money can, can attain for you, uh, that becomes a problem when you err from the faith, begin to teach falsehood or follow falsehood uh, in order for financial gain. So we, we kind of talked about that and the principles, and you see that all through the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the kingdom, and then of course in the dispensation of grace when you get to Paul's epistles, you see all of that uh, teaching about money and, and the relationship that the love of money has to erring from the faith. Um, so we, we kind of went from that into talking about, well then how does God want us to give? Once we understand what our attitude about money should be and our relationship with money should be, then we can talk about giving to the Lord. And there's three things that we want to talk about um, in relation to giving. One is, and we talked about this the last couple of weeks, attitude. The second is answer, and the third, of course, is amount, which we'll get to in a couple weeks here. So we want to talk about the attitude of grace, of grace giving. We did that last week, and each one of these things, what we want to do is talk about it in the, in the law-based economy, in the kingdom economy, and then in the dispensation of grace. Uh, giving, like so many things, is something that you find all through Scripture. It's like prayer. You find it all through Scripture. Forgiveness, you find all through Scripture. But the reasons for it, the motivation for it, the response of God to it, those things change as we go from the law to the kingdom to grace. And so the same is true with giving. Um, it doesn't matter. You go to Genesis 14. Abraham gave tithes of all to Melchizedek, king of Salem. You go all the way through um, to Paul's epistles. He's still talking about giving, taking up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. So giving is always there, but the attitudes the, the, about it change. The attitudes that we have in giving change um, as other things of the economy changes. The motivation of the law is fear. Uh, Moses said, I want you to take this book of the law every seven years, read it to the children of Israel, that they may learn to fear the Lord their God. Uh, and to observe all his commandments and statutes and ordinances. There's a fear of the curse that comes for disobeying God. And there's a desire to attain that blessing. Um, we saw Ananias and Sapphira, how that they brought, uh, they brought what they sold, but they kept part of it back. Um, they dropped dead in the middle of the assembly, and great fear came upon all those that believed. Um, so law is very much a, a motivation of fear. Fear that I'm going to get that curse from God if I don't obey. Um, also, the law is based on proving God. Uh, we, Israel would perform in a certain way, and then God would respond. So God, under the law, God is always responding to man. I do this, and God responds to it. I do this other thing, God responds to it. In grace, we're always responding to God. Our motivation is love. The love of Christ constrains us, and we respond to what he's done for us. It's not that we do something and we wait to see what God's going to do. He has done all he needs to do. When he provided the sacrifice of Christ, when he saved us, when he sanctified us, when he justified us, all those things he did for us in Christ, when he blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, when he did all that for us, he's done all he needs to do. 
the response is now on us to respond to him, to respond to what he's done. So, so it's very different, the attitudes, and an attitude, um, the other word you could use for that, which, which wouldn't make my alliterated outline, is motivation. What is your motivation to give? Um, what's the motivation of the law as opposed to the motivation of grace? What's the motivation to get into the kingdom as opposed to the motivation we have today in grace? So, so the motivation is very different, and we spent a couple weeks talking about that. Today we want to move to the answer, and another word that we could use for answer is expectation. When, when we give to the Lord, what's our expectation, if any, of Him? Or of, of anything. What, what do we expect to have happen when we give to the Lord? So let's go back to Deuteronomy 28. And of course Deuteronomy 28, uh, it's a passage that we use often when we're talking about our, uh, the law and the motivation of the law. Because it is the classic passage about the blessings and cursings of the law. And it is that because you know, Deuteronomy is a book, it's the second giving of the law. Deuteros, pneumos means second giving. And it's where Moses takes all the principles of the law and all the commandments of the law in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and he rehearses them before the children of Israel before they enter the land, the promised land. And so it's, it's, it's taking all the law and kind of compressing it and giving the principles of the law to Israel one last time before they go into the land. And, and that's the case in Deuteronomy 28 where he gives these principles of the blessings and the cursings. And in verse 1, excuse me, of Deuteronomy 28, it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. If you go down to verse 11, the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season. Bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. So if you obey me, one of the, the, the results of that obedience, and one of those obediences would be in tithes and offerings. When we get to the amount of giving uh, in a couple weeks here, we'll talk about the tithe system under the law. And the tithe, we often say, well, it's, it's a tenth. And tithe does mean tenth. But under the law, there are at least two tithes that they gave every year. They gave a tithe to the priesthood, they gave a tithe to the Lord, and then every third year, they gave a, 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 an additional tithe for the fatherless and the widow. So they had two tithes every year, that's 20%, three tithes on the third year, that's 30%, plus offerings under the law. So, so the system of giving under the law is very detailed, uh, it's very complicated you know, compared to what Paul says about grace, but there is this system and part of that system and part of maintaining that system and obeying that system is in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 28, the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy cattle, the fruit of thy ground. So plenteous in goods. What are goods? Things, stuff, dishwasher, air conditioner, you know, all that kind of stuff. Anything, anything that is goods is, I'll make you plenteous in goods. Now, obviously in Israel they didn't have dishwashers, air conditioners, all that. But in today's terms, it's the stuff that you have. It's the stuff that's in your house. The goods. Uh, in the fruit of thy body. That means you're going to have children and the children are going to prosper. The fruit of thy cattle. That's the animals, the, the cattle, the sheep, the kind, the, the oxen. You're gonna, they're going to bear abundantly. The fruit of thy ground. That means your vineyards and the corn and the, the, the wheat is all going to grow and prosper. So all those areas, the goods that you have, the food that you grow in the ground, the animals that you raise, and even your children. You're going to have multiplied children and they're going to have multiplied children. And all of this, the end of verse 11, in the land 
which the Lord swore unto thy fathers. It's always about that land that God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So you're going to receive all these things. If you give, and, and here you're, you're getting the, the, the response of God. If you do this, then I'll do this. So it's always putting God on the response mode. Israel does something, now they have to wait for God to respond so that they know what his attitude is about it. Down in verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, cursed shall thou be in the field, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. So, the, the, all, notice all the things that get blessed for obedience get cursed for disobedience. Verse uh, 18, cursed is the, the, well, verse 17, first of all, thy basket and thy store, all those goods that you have, they're going to be cursed. Uh, verse 18, cursed will be the fruit of thy body, your children and their children, the fruit of thy land, everything you grow on this land, the, the, the fruits, the vegetables, whatever you grow, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep, the animals that you raise. So everything that got blessed for obedience gets cursed for disobedience. And there's the second part of the law, which is we obey because we fear the curse. We don't want that curse. We don't want to be cursed, so we obey. So the answer, the expectation that we have is that God is going to respond. And if we give properly, he's going to bless us. And if we don't give properly, he's going to curse us. Now, that, that principle is what 99.9 maybe percent of all uh, teaching about giving is based on today. You turn on the TV this morning, you turn on the radio this morning, you go online this morning, you listen to preachers, you listen to them telling you, you know, about how to give, what to give, when to give, where to give, why to give. Because if you give, that's why they'll say, if you're in debt, if you're so far in debt that you can't ever see your way out, what should you do? Yeah. Give. Give me money. Because God is going to respond to that. See, understand, the law puts God, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the law puts God on the spot to be proven. Will God do what he said he's going to do? And these people that teach that way, they're always putting it on God. It's God, it's your fault. It's your responsibility. Now, I gave out of debt and you haven't sent me that money so it's your fault that I'm still in debt it's your fault that I'm this way it's your fault that this has happened because they're waiting for that response from God if you go to Malachi then we looked at this passage a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the attitude uh, but it certainly applies here when we when we talk about um, the the answer that we expect from God um, the answer in Malachi chapter 3 and in Malachi 3 uh, verse 7, even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. So, what is just, just that statement? You return to me, and I will return to you. So, who, who does that put in the response mode? God. God does, because it puts God... You return, God tells Israel, you return to me, and here's what I'll do. I'll return to you. And the law is always that way. The law is always saying, if, if you do this, then here's what I'll do. And once you've done that thing that the law prescribes, then it's on God to respond. That's why God is always telling Israel, I'm a faithful and true God. I will be faithful to what I've promised. And if you do what I prescribed, I will be faithful. And, and that's exactly what Malachi is saying here. Return unto me and I will return. Did, did, you have to, did you have to return to the Lord 
when you got saved, did you return anything to him? First of all, were you ever his to begin with? If you're going to return to somebody, what's it mean you had to be? You had to be theirs to begin with. You were never his to begin with. So you can't return to the Lord because you were never his. The nation Israel was his chosen nation. They went away and he says, return back to me. You, 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 you can't do what that verse said because you were never his. Return to me and I will return to you. But ye said, verse, the end of verse 7, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. That's a, that tithes and offerings we'll talk about when we talk about the amount of giving. In tithes and offerings, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the, before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, and ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So, prove me now. The, what's the answer from God? What did it, if Israel brought the tithes into the storehouse? What did they expect was going to happen? God would do what he, God would open up the windows of heaven, pour them out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It, it it's it is the classic based system. If you do this thing, then here's how God will respond. And he is faithful to always respond in the way that he said he's going to respond. See, our, we have a legal system in this country, a law-based system, but does it always respond the same way to everybody? No. Probably not. In fact, definitely not. But God says, my system is I am faithful and I will always do what I say I will do. In fact, keep your hand here, Abalakai, go back to 2 Chronicles. To the two, you know, if I had to pick two most misused verses in, in, in all of Scripture, these are certainly in the top ten. And both of them uh, are the same principle. And that's, that's what's important to see when we're talking about this, that, that, expectation and the answer we expect to giving. 2 Chronicles 7, 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. 2 Chronicles 7, 13. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And again it's always all about the land. And he says, if I shut up heaven, verse 13, that there be no rain. If I command locusts to devour the land. If, wh why would God do all those things? Because Israel's in obedience or disobedience? Disobedience. disobedience. So if you're in disobedience and I've done all these things to you, then you, you humble yourselves, you pray, you seek my face, you come to this temple that Solomon just dedicated and you repent. And I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. So everything about the law is in that passage. Israel did not obey God. They did not fear God. Therefore, they got a curse. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. Now God says, you're cursed. If you obey me and humble yourselves and pray and repent, then I... I will take away the curse. I'll forgive your sin and I'll heal the land and it will prosper again. You do something and then you wait on me to respond. That's exactly what, what Malachi chapter 3 says, specifically related to giving. Um, you are cursed with a curse, verse 9 of Malachi 3. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. It's, it's, it's the classic law. And, and these two passages, people will beat people over the head with these two passages maybe more than any other two Old Testament passages about, so you've got to do you have to do this and if you do this, 
then here's what God will do. You put God on the spot. So it, you bring the tithes into the storehouse, and that's the way giving is taught. And the nation, if, if my people which are called by my name, that's the way repentance is taught. Here's what you got to do, and then here's what God's going to do. And you do this, and God will do that, and you do this, and God will do that. And that's not... What else does God have to do for you if he saved you? There's not a thing. No, absolutely. In fact, this whole concept is return to me and I will return to you. You know what Paul says? While we were yet sinners, Christ died. When we were enemies, Christ died. When we were without strength, Christ died. Do, wh wh where, where were you? What were you doing when Christ died for your sins? Pfft, you know, you, you weren't even here, and the world in general was nothing, absolutely nothing. This idea that you got to do something and then wait for God to respond to it. I'm going to do this, and then God will do something good for me. That, that's that's the law, and it has no place in grace. What? Whether it's about giving or anything else. We're talking about giving in this series, so we're applying it to giving. But understand, it, that's the motivation that ministries use to get people to do all kinds of things. And there is no place for that in the dispensation of grace. There is no place for saying, well, you know, if, if you, if you want to get something from God, you got to give something to him. Because that's, that's not what grace is. It's totally contrary to grace. There's no place for saying, well, if you're in debt and you need some money, give something to God and he'll give back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. That's not the way grace operates. It's the way the law operated, and you see it operating here. It's, in fact, go, go to uh, Luke chapter 12. Let's turn, it, turn the temperature up a notch. I hope not. It's hot enough in here already. Um, but let's let's. Isn't it hot, Rhonda? No. no. Rhonda says it's hot. No. You think it's hot, don't you? No. Yes, sir. You just don't want to get the old ladies mad at you. I really don't. <laughs> well, so you must be something wrong with you then, because you're you're always the one I can count on to be hot too. I'm so. Uh, mm, okay. All right. So, every when you get to the kingdom, everything about the law notches up. So, so. The law said, thou shalt not commit adultery. The kingdom says, if you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery all ever, already. The law says, thou shalt not kill. The kingdom says, if you hate, hate your brother without a cause, you've committed murder already. The law says, you bring these tithes, 10%, 10%, 10%, you give me some offerings. The kingdom says, sell all that you have and give alms. So, Everything about the kingdom becomes more extreme. And in Luke chapter 12, he's talking about the kingdom, and he's talking about what they're to give. Verse, um, uh, sorry, verse 22 of Luke 12. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which, uh, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you by taking thought can add to his statue one, stature one cubit? Uh, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, lilies how they toil, how uh, they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If if then God so clothed the grass which is today is in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will He clothe you, O ye of little faith? So what's the, the message here to the little flock, to the, those that are pressing to the kingdom? Your, your father, your God, is able to feed the ravens and clothe the grass of the field. That's what your God is able to do. So if your God is able to do that, then is he able to take care of you? Yes, he is. Your God is able to, to clothe the grass of the field even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like the grass of the field. 
Your, your God is able to feed the ravens and the fowls of the air. And they don't have storehouses and barns and all the rest. So he's able to take care of you. You don't have to store things up. He's able to take care of you. But notice verse 29. And, and seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Seek ye the kingdom. So what happens in the... Keep your hand here and go to Isaiah chapter 35. What happens in the kingdom? Seek ye... Don't, don't seek all these things of the world. Don't seek what ye shall eat. Don't seek what ye shall wear. Don't seek where you're going to live. But you seek the kingdom. Isaiah 35 is one of the, the classic passages about the kingdom. And he says in, in verse... Um, Verse 4, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. So it's talking about a time when God comes to the earth and he saves the nation Israel out of tribulation. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then shall the lame man leap as in heart, the tongue of the dumb sing, and the wilderness shall waters break out, streams in the desert, the parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and an highway shall be there, and a way that is called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall, be, it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The streams of the desert shall blossom as a rose, he says earlier in the passage. So, so that land that's been cursed with a curse and is not fruitful and not bearing for the nation, what's going to happen when the Lord returns? The curse is removed. The kingdom is about God removing the curse from a specific geographic area on the planet. The, the planet, the earth is cursed with a curse because of Adam. And when the Lord returns, he takes that land that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and just through, 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 he just waves his hand, and boom, the curse is gone. And that land blossoms like a rose. And streams break out in the desert. And um, the parched ground shall become a pool. And the thirsty land springs of water. A highway shall be there called holiness. All of that happens in the land that God gave. To, that's why that land is so important to them. That's why they fight over that land even today. Because that's the land where their God is going to come. Where their God is going to save them. Where they are going to make the desert to blossom. Now, understand, most of those Jews that are there today, they think they're doing it. They're going to make the desert blossom as a rose. They're going to accomplish all that. These passages are about God returning and doing it. Go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Another passage about the kingdom. Ezekiel 36 and verse number 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. See again, it's about the land that God gave to their fathers. Verse 29, I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field and ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the nations I'll call for the corn I'll increase uh, in verse um, verse uh, 29 I'll call for the corn no famine verse 30 multiply the fruit of the tree multiply the increase of the field all the things that, that I promised, all the blessings of the law become reality in the kingdom. 
All the things I promised, if you obey me in the law, when you get into the kingdom, you have them all. It's no longer, if you obey me, it's now, you've made it into the kingdom, here they are. So when you look at Luke chapter 12, and he says in verse 30, All these things do the nations of the earth, the world seek after. Your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So the nations of the earth, they're, they're the nations that are out there in the earth, but there's my people in their land, and I have something special planned for them. Verse 31, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So you need to, to, to sell that you have, but if I tell you, if you, come and, if you sell all that you have and come and follow me, then you get the kingdom. So if I've read Isaiah 35, and I've read Ezekiel 36, then what do I think that means? I'm going to get rid of all I have, but when I get rid of all I have, I get the kingdom in return. For one thing, those things they have, how did they get them? God gave them to them. Hmm? They earned them. They, they, they worked for them. Notice what he says down in verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. God is blessing them, but they still have to... That, that, that ground that is, is now uh, fruitful and, and, and brings forth much fruit, but you still got to cultivate it. You still got to sow the seeds... You still got to harvest the harvest. You still got to do all these things. So you're still working for. And once you have a big house, then what do you have to do? Clean it. Hmm? Clean, it. clean it. There you go. I was going with maintain, but clean is good too. You got to clean it. You got to maintain it. You got to clean the stuff out of the gutters. You got to pay the taxes on it. You got to you know fix the deck. You got to do this. You got to do that. So once you have it, so so. Even though Israel has lots of stuff, in the context of this world, they still got to maintain it. They, they get it by toil. They have to work it. Even though God is blessed, sending the rain in his due season, making the ground fruitful, all of that, you're still working to attain all that stuff. But what's the case in the kingdom? It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. Do the lilies of the field work to look like they look? Yeah. They just do. And so, so his, his offer to Israel, what's the, the answer? His offer to Israel and their expectation, his offer is, look, you get rid of all this stuff that you have to maintain and take care of and clean, and I'll give you a whole new set of stuff that you don't have to clean. You know, in a kingdom, nothing gets dirty. That's your place, right? Nothing gets dirty. Nothing gets sick. Nobody has to work. It's, it's like the Garden of Eden. God will provide. Go back to Matthew 19. The rich young ruler. We looked at a little bit of this a couple weeks ago, but the rich young ruler is a good, another good illustration. Verse 16 of Matthew 19 and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You, you sell all that you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now Paul tells us, set your affection on things above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. 
Where is your treasure right now? Above. Above. So the moment you believed, you were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So right now, that's where your treasure is. Notice what he says to this rich young ruler. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Did you have to do all that stuff to get your treasure in heaven? You just believed. And he said, I, I give you that treasure. In it's, it's yours. And it's a spiritual thing in heaven. And you sell all that you have, thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And this, that, that legalistic law-based system enters into everything today. Because if you listen to the presentation of the gospel, and when, 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 when preachers on TV and radio get to the end of their presentation, you need to listen to what they say and pretend that you're not saved. Pretend you don't know anything about how to be saved. And listen to what they say and think, if I did what they just said, would, would I be saved? Could I get saved? Because here, here's almost always the opening. You need to turn from your sins and make Jesus Lord of your life. So how many of you in this room have accomplished that? Turned completely from your sins and made Jesus completely Lord of your life. We'll bring Tammy out and uh, we'll see. Turn completely from your sins and make Jesus completely Lord of your life. See, that's, that's a non-starter because you can't do it. You can't do it. Turn from your sins. But he tells this man, you, you sell all that you have. In essence, you make me Lord of your life and you come and follow me. And if you do all that, I'll give you treasure in heaven. So the answer, the expectation is if I do this thing, and remember it's all ramped up. Because now it's not just bring your tithe, it's sell it all. And you'll get this treasure in the kingdom. Verse uh, 23, Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus uh, beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then, answered, P then uh, answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So Peter speaks up, and he's always the one that you know, is the most bold and aggressive. And he says, Well, now, now Lord, you just told that guy, Sell all that you have. And come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. So Peter says, well, wait a minute, I think that's what we did. I remember I was out there fishing, and you came that day and said, hey, come on. And we just threw our nets away, and off we went. So now, what, what's your answer to that? Uh, what's our expectation supposed to be? And of course, verse 28, Jesus said unto the verily, I said to you, in uh, ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory. That's the kingdom. When the Son of Man sits upon the throne of his glory. In the re when I regenerate that land that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in that day, you'll sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and verse, uh, the end of verse 29, As many as forsaken father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold. So there it is. You, a rich young ruler, you sell all that you have and in the kingdom you'll get it back a hundredfold. Is that a good investment? <laughs> That's the expectation. That's the expectation. That's the answer that God has. Both in the law and the kingdom, the answer is, if you do this thing, then here's what I'm going to do.
In the law, I'm going to bless you, bless the fruit of your uh, body, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your, your animals. In the kingdom, I'm going to do even one better. I'm going to just remove the curse from that land and I'm going to put you in that land and it's going to flow with milk and honey and there's going to be streams in the wilderness and in the desert and you will have no famine anymore and I'll call for the corn and I'll increase the fruit of your vine and it, there'll be no sorrow, no sighing, no tears, none of it. If you come and do this. And, and, and in each one of these cases, in essence, God is saying, Prove me now. Prove me and see if I won't do this. So in the kingdom and in the law, the answer, the expectation when you give is I'm going to benefit. I'm going to receive something back for this. God is going to bless me in some way for this. And as I said, 99% of all the teaching you hear about giving today is based on that. It, the, the, nobody ever says... You know, except maybe here and a few other grace churches. You know what? You give money and it's gone. <laughs> and you ain't getting it back. That's all there is to it. It's going for other purposes. It's going for good purposes. But you, you're not, you not going to give us $100 and then have, have God give you back 1000 That is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. Now, that... That makes it more difficult to motivate people to give, doesn't it? You know, if you do that, if you say, "I'm gonna," you give me a hundred, God will give you back a thousand. Okay, now we're now we're now we're talking. But if I say you give us a hundred, you know what? It's gone. <laughs> you ain't never getting it back. Then that's harder. That's harder. But that's grace. So let's get one passage, one verse as we click, because this is kind of Second Corinthians chapter nine. This is the verse. And it's a verse that next week we'll spend a lot of time talking about and, and seek to understand what does Paul mean here? Because he, he, he invokes this law of sowing and reaping. And he says, um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse uh, 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. So, so verse 7 is about the attitude. We, we looked at last week, uh, verse 7, Every man according as the purpose within his heart, so let him give, not grudging or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So that's the attitude, should be cheerfulness. You know, and and a lot, some of the new Bibles, when you hear people preaching about it, they'll say, well, you know, that word cheerful, uh, that Greek word there, that's the word we get our word hilarious from. So God loves a hilarious giver. But I want you to think about that. God loves a hilarious giver. When you, when you say, oh man, that was hilarious, what, what, what do you mean? What, what, what are you saying? It was funny. It was funny. It made me laugh. When you say, I was full of good cheer, what does that mean? Happy. Happy? Does that mean you're like, ha, 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 oh man, that was a good one. Is that cheerful? Joy. Joy. Joy's a good word. Uh, the point is this, it, it, God, God does not want you to give hilariously. He, I don't want to see anybody dancing, Woo, I'm going to go back and put me some money in the box. <laughs> mm -mm. Don't change the words. Cheerful, joyful, happy, all good. Hilarious? Mm -mm. It's not about hilarious giving. People, they'll tell, uh, you, I hear that all the time. God wants you to give hilariously, so let's all laugh and dance down the aisle. Mm -mm. You can do things cheerfully and joyfully, and it's not hilarious. You know, hilarious is like the Carol Burnett show, or you know, some old time show that before TV got crappy. You know, that's hilarious. That's not the way you give. The way you give is with cheerfulness, with joy, not grudgingly or of necessity. That's a, now, now, under the law, if God said, you give or I'm going to curse you, well, then you darn well better, right? You better give, because if you don't, you're going to get the curse. Paul even says over in chapter 8, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians, I speak not by commandment. I, uh, he's talking about giving. I speak not by commandment. It is not a commandment. 
it's something you should be cheerful to do. But as far as the answer, the expectation, verse 6 of chapter 9, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the question in that verse that we need to answer, ask, and hopefully answer next week is, what are we reaping? He which soweth sparingly is going to reap sparingly. He which soweth bountifully. See, that, that almost sounds like the kingdom, doesn't it? So, is Paul saying, if you give a lot, you're going to reap a lot. If you give a little, you're going to reap a little. Is that what he's saying? Certainly he is saying that, but the question is, what are you reaping? When we sow... And he's, he's doing this in the context of giving. So when we sow, when we give, what do we reap? Either sparingly or bountifully. And we'll talk about that next week. What, so we know, how does God answer our giving? What should our expectation be? when we give? I've already told you, <laughs> if you're putting it here, you don't expect to get it back. Because we're going to use it for stuff. And, and, and God's not going to give it back to you. You're just going to get used. So, but, but in that, that being said, then how do you reap bountifully when you sow? And we'll talk about that next week. That's the tease for next week, all right? Uh, let's bow in a word of prayer. God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity of giving um, that your word might go forward. And uh, we just pray as we do that we would always do so cheerfully out of a joyful heart. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.